So we are privileged, privileged to have uh, two of the most popular teachers in the English department here tonight with us. <laughs> Uh, and one of them is going to introduce uh, Kristen. And so I would like to introduce our introducer first. <laughs> and uh, that's Brandy Siegfried. Um, let me just, she sent me something that I think is really good. Um, Dr. Brandy R. Siegfried professes English Renaissance literature here at BYU. Her interest in questions of belief are long standing beginning with her first published article in 1996, Gambling on God, The Culture of Card Games in George Herbert's Temple. And that's in the George Herbert Journal 19. And continuing with the volume of essays she recently co-edited with Lisa Sarasan, titled God and Nature in the Thought of Margaret Cavendish, which appeared last year. She is just wrapping up a modern spelling edition of Poems and Fancies by the same famous 17th century science philosopher, philosopher Margaret Cavendish just noted and continues working on a monograph titled The Tree of Life in English Renaissance Literature. Dr. Siegfried. I'm shorter. <laughs> What's a pleasure to introduce Professor Kristen Matthews, the Laura F. Willis Center for Book of Mormon Studies invited speaker who will be delivering our annual Book of Mormon lecture this evening. Dr. Matthews teaches courses in American literature and culture here at BYU, specializing in the 20th century with a particular emphasis on the Cold War and including a further subspecialty in 20th century African American literature. In her research and teaching, she, she prefers to put canonical literature into conversation with a range of political, historical, sociological, and popular texts in order to best examine American letters in life. No surprise that since 2011, she's been the program coordinator for BYU's American Studies program. Professor Matthews graduated summa cum laude with a BA in English from BYU in 1995, before going on to complete a PhD in American literature from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2004. Her scholarly work has appeared in academic venues such as American Studies, Arizona Quarterly, Modern Drama, Journal of American Culture, and the Journal of Popular Culture, among many others. Her book, titled A is for America, Cold War Literature and the Politics of Reading, is forthcoming from the University of Massachusetts Press. Professor Mass, I have a little bit of food coma. We just ate, <laughs> so forgive me. Professor Matthews has received various awards, including American Studies Professor of the Year in 2007, the English Department Teaching Award also in 2007, an Alcuin Fellowship from GE and Honors here at BYU in 2011, and the Faculty Women's Association Teaching Award in 2012. She's also a recipient of an Albert J. Colton Fellowship from the Utah Humanities Council, 2010, and the Stone Suderman Prize awarded for the American Studies Journal, from the American Studies Journal, for Best Article, which was awarded in 2013. When not at work, Dr. Matthews can be found reading a book or cheering on, cheering on her beloved Green Bay Packers. And remember that as a native Wisconsinite, she's part owner of the team, right? So hurrah. <laughs> Um, but she also enjoys baking fancy desserts, hiking in the mountains, playing the piano, or singing with her jazz combo. She is, in short, a well-rounded individual whose public teaching and scholarship are nicely balanced by the creativity, fun, and community service of her personal life. On a more personal note, I've known Kristen for over 20 years. As an undergraduate, she took a class from me when I was a brand new professor here at BYU, and I remember her buoyant intelligence and infectious enthusiasm with gratitude. There's no question but that her social skills, and most of you have felt the generous warmth of them, <laughs> um, then also so generously shared among her peers in that class, helped shape a very rough cut idea of a course into an actual class. She corresponded with me during her later adventures in graduate school, and when, after completing her PhD, she landed a job here at BYU, I did not hesitate to wrangle her into joining me to be part of a Stake Relief Society presidency for the BYU Ninth Stake. And I am willing to acknowledge that a certain amount of begging may have taken place on my part. 
Um, but I have to tell you, she was simply superb. Her warm camaraderie with students, her fierce, even passionate testimony of the Savior, and her creative genius for teaching the gospel blessed the lives of hundreds of young ward members throughout the state. That is so appropriate, actually. <laughs> nice cueing. <laughs> As her list of accolades suggests, she has since become something of a superstar among her colleagues. She serves students and faculty tirelessly even as she extends her intellectual gifts to explore issues of justice, compassion, and community in her scholarship. On top of all this, Kristen is also a talented cook. Her skill in laying up jars of culinary delights are far better than those of either of my own grandmothers, who were quite proud of their peaches, apple compote, and pickled string beans, and far and away better than my own, now long ago, mason jar forays into growing, washing, peeling, cooking, and sealing. <laughs> Though a 20th century specialist, Kristen clearly has a robust appreciation for the arts and crafts of previous periods, and many of us here at BYU have been the beneficiaries of her generosity in this regard. In short, we have with us tonight one who puts me in mind of King Benjamin's words when he said to his people, Behold, when I said unto you that I had spent my days in your service, I do not desire to boast, for I have only been in the service of God. And behold, I tell you these things that ye may learn wisdom, and that ye may learn that ye are in the service of your, when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. Dr. Matthew's talk this evening, as you can see, is titled, Come into the Field Fold of God, Caring for the Poor and Needy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kristen Matthews. Good evening. I would like to thank the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for inviting me to speak with you, the Willis family for their generosity, my family and friends who came from near and far to support me, and all of you who chose to join us tonight. Please suffer me as I begin my remarks with a disclaimer. No, not a disclaimer like I often get from my students when they bring a rough draft to me for feedback. I'm sorry this is any good, or I wrote it late last night, I'm still working it out, or I wrote it when I had a headache, or my roommates were having a dance party, and so on. Uh, but rather, a disclaimer that functions more as an introduction. I am a graduate of neither divinity school nor a rabbinical program. I've not done postgraduate work in ancient scripture or languages. I've published neither books nor articles on scriptural matters, despite Blair Hodge's attempts. Instead, I received my PhD in American literature from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm a student and scholar of stories. In particular, I'm drawn to those stories that help us understand the ways in which we can create a more humane world. I study stories written by those who often have been denied a voice in America's social and political conversations. And I examine how these individuals strive to be recognized as persons of value with something to contribute to the larger national tale. Furthermore, I research how stories are used in this world how they are transmitted, received, and revised. Thus, my approach to the Book of Mormon may differ from some of the scholars who have shared their thoughts with you on nights previous. I approach this book as a collection of stories written to teach readers how to become better humans and disciples of Jesus Christ. According to its own narrative, the Book of Mormon stories have two audiences, the people of its day and the people of our day. Thus, as I read this text, I'm drawn to how the people in the stories themselves read, receive, and act upon the words of God. And as I think on this text, I try to understand how people in our day have read, received, and acted upon the lessons that these stories teach. Hence, my remarks today will focus on stories that illuminate what I see as a central theme of the Book of Mormon, poverty and social justice identifying the lessons it teaches within the narrative framework of the text and what lessons it has for us today. In rereading the Book of Mormon for this lecture, I've come to believe that the pride cycle to which Latter-day Saints so often refer is a misnomer. Rather, I believe it is a greed cycle. Pride may lead to the ultimate fall of individuals and nations within the narrative, but pride is always the result of individuals' greed. 
their hunger for riches, resources, finery, power, or authority. One is proud of attaining those things, and thus pride is a consequence rather than a cause. The desire for riches and power leads to the corruption of nations, individuals, and the church throughout the Book of Mormon, and could be called the fatal flaw that catalyzes the text's central action and instruction. Furthermore, it is clear from both authorial and editorial warnings directed to modern day readers from the dust the, that Book of Mormon prophets knew a primary problem of our times would be the privileging of wealth over God and his children. In Ether 823, Mormon explains his editorial emphasis on greed's destructive nature by saying, wherefore, O ye Gentiles, it is wisdom in God that these things should be shown unto you, that thereby ye may repent of your sins and suffer not that these murderous combinations shall get above you, which are built up to get power and gain, and the work, yea, even the work of destruction come upon you, yea, even the sword of justice of the eternal God shall fall upon you to your overthrow and destruction, if ye shall suffer these things to be. Too often, we as Latter-day Saints are quick to assign such behaviors to other churches or the world. However, Mormon is speaking to us and he is warning us of the ways in which we might corrupt our doctrine to justify the pursuit of wealth and power at the expense of the poor among us. Every Book of Mormon prophet warns readers to beware of greed's power to possess, distort, and corrupt. Yet we've largely turned a deaf ear to such as a world, nation, and people, preferring instead to worship the false idols of wealth, acquisition, status, and power about which the, these prophets warned us. In May 2012, UNICEF reported that the United States has the second highest rate of poverty, the lowest life expectancy, and the highest infant mortality of all developed countries in the world. Close to 50% of all Americans are living at, near, or below the poverty level. The Liahona Foundation reports that within the LDS Church alone, over 120,000 children are malnourished. And according to another study, by 2030, an additional 30 million members of the church will be poor. Although the LDS Church amended its threefold mission in 2009 to add a fourth mission, care for the poor and needy, I fear too few members know or recognize these change, too few actually believe in it, and too little time is spent discussing how to accomplish its charge. For these reasons and others, I'd like to examine what the Book of Mormon has to say about our duty to care for the poor and the needy so that we might understand better the charge God has put before us and be counted among his disciples on the last day. The cautionary tale that is the Book of Mormon is framed by stories of greed and its destructive nature. The occasion for the Book of First Nephi and the catalyst for the whole narrative is that the Jews of Jerusalem have worshiped false idols and put the things of the world above God and his children. Consequently, Lehi prophesies that Jerusalem will be destroyed and the Jews will be carried away into captivity. His word angers the Jews, particularly those in positions of power, and put Lehi's life in danger. Accordingly, he and his family flee Jerusalem, leaving his house and the land of his inheritance and his gold and his silver and his precious things and took nothing with him, save it were his family and provisions and tents, and departed into the wilderness. And so doing, Lehi multiply exemplifies discipleship. He heeds the word of God, speaks the word of God, and privileges God's word above, above wealth, status, and power. He commands his sons to use the family's gold, silver, and precious things to acquire the brass plates, and in so doing, again privileges God and his word over material goods. This introduces the second key conflict in the Book of Mormon that has implications for future generations of Nephites and Lamanites and various other ites. Laman and Lemuel are angered that they are forced to give up their wealth, status, and power, and they blame Lehi, Nephi, and their God for that loss. In scenario after scenario, Laman and Lemuel demonstrate that a love of their inheritance over the word of God, their brothers' lives, and the good of their people. 
They believe that those precious things belong to them, that they deserve them, and that using their gold, silver, and jewels to secure God's word for successive generations is an affront to their persons and status. Not unlike those in the great and spacious building of their father's vision, Laman and Lemuel believe that wealth makes them better than others and are willing to cheat, lie, and kill in order to gain and retain it. Likewise, the final battle and ultimate destruction of the Nephites is rooted in greed and its concomitant violence. As we learn from Mormon and Moroni, the desire for wealth and power has led to the formation of both public and secret institutions, combinations, that privilege the few and oppress the many. Institutions originally formed, as noted in the book of Helaman, because they began to set their hearts upon their riches. Yea, they began to seek to get gain, that they might be lifted up above one another. Therefore, they began to commit secret murders and to rob and plunder, that they might get gain. The desire for more wealth, resources, and power led to many wars and what proved to be the Book of Mormon's final battle. It is no coincidence, I think, that Moroni quotes Mormon's speech on charity at exactly this point in the text. Inciting his father, Moroni underscores the cause of his people's destru destruction, greed, and the means of presenting such in future times, charity. Whereas the Nephite people have been impatient, cruel, envious, proud, selfish, easily provoked, rooted in iniquity, and obsessed with their own gain, behaviors that are the opposite of Christian behavior, the people to whom Moroni is speaking at the text close, us, have the potential to learn from this destructive selfishness and to turn our gaze outward as Christian behavior demands. Thus, the Book of Mormon is framed by tales and explicit warnings to Latter-day readers that one of the greatest problems and obstacles God's children will struggle with in our time is greed, selfishness, and the desire for power at the cost of charity and a love for all of God's children. Sandwiched in this frame is story after story in which greed leads to the destruction of the church. In his typical heavy-handed way as editor, Mormon breaks into the story to moralize. Now this great loss of the Nephites and the great slaughter which was among them would not have happened had it not been for their wickedness and their abomination which was among them. Yea, and it was among those also who professed to belong to the church of God. And it was because of the pride of their hearts, because of their exceeding riches. Yea, it was because of their oppression of, to the poor, withholding their food from the hungry, withholding their clothing from the naked and smiting their humble brethren upon the cheek. And because of this, their great wickedness and their boastings in their own strength, they were left in their own strength. Therefore, they did not prosper, but were afflicted and smitten and driven before the Lamanites until they had lost possession of almost all of their lands. Here, Mormon identifies the pattern that can be seen throughout the Book of Mormon. First, because of their love of riches, the Nephites corrupt the word of God to justify both further acquisition and withholding means from the poor. Second, the Nephites fail to recognize that their riches are gifts from God, instead believing they are rich because of their own greatness and great because of their riches. Third, their false superiority functions as rationale for oppressing the poor, therein making a mockery of the title Christian and leading them to apostasy. Finally, as a result, God leaves the Nephites, allowing them to be smitten, driven out of the property, and deprived of the riches they love above all. Perhaps the best example of this pattern is King Noah, descendant of Kings Mosiah and Benjamin, an inheritor of a distinguished legacy of charity and righteousness. Unlike his ancestor, Noah placed his heart upon riches, taxing his people not to improve the quality of their lives, but rather to finance his lavish lifestyle of riotous living, clothes, vineyards, chariots, spacious palaces, so on and so forth. And we read that rather than keep the commandments of God, he did walk after the desires of his own heart. We learn many things from the story of King Noah and his priests. First, the phrase he put his heart upon his riches identified that which he loves and privileges above all else. His greed is an active thing, signaled by the verb to put, and it drives oppressive policies that serve to increase his wealth. In so doing, he creates a society divided by, between a small minority of wealthy priests who live off the labor of others and a majority of the people who are forced to, quote, labor exceedingly to support the iniquity. 
of this privileged group. Second, King Noah and his priests corrupt the teachings of God to justify their pursuit of riches and the current social order. This is at the crux of Abinadi's question. If ye teach the law of Moses, why do ye not keep it? Why do ye set your heart upon riches? Abinadi points out the hypocrisy in the priests' behaviors. They claim to teach the law of Moses, but they fail to keep its provisions, which include command after command to care for the poor, the needy, and the strangers among the children of Israel. In so doing, they set themselves up above the law, assuming a superior godlike status. Third, not only is this hypocrisy, but it is also apostasy. As those charged with the spiritual welfare of their people, the priest's corruption of the law of Moses has trickled down to much of King Noah's people who follow the example of these false priests and face not only spiritual, but also physical destruction. Abinadi warns that, except this people repent and turn unto the Lord their God, they shall be brought into bondage and none shall deliver them except it be the Lord, the Almighty God. Because King Noah bound his heart to riches, all suffered spiritual bondage of apostasy and the physical bondage of war. Throughout the Book of Mormon and in our time, false prophets have counseled that it is good to seek wealth, that individuals are wealthy because of their own merits, and that those who have more do so because they're more righteous, and that those who have less do so because they are immoral. These individuals twist Christ's doctrine to justify the pursuit of excess, the privileging of the wealthy, and the oppression of the poor. Indeed, they behave like Nahor and other antichrists during Alma's time, those who loved the vain things of the world, and they went forth preaching false doctrines, and this they did for the sake of riches and honor. As Elder Nelson noted in the May 1986 General Conference, when the Lord sent prophets to call Israel back from apostasy, in almost every instance, one of the first charges made was that the poor had been neglected. We see this in Helaman when Nephi queries, oh, how could you have forgotten your God on the very day that he has delivered you? But behold, it is to get gain, to be praised of men, yea, and that ye might get gold and silver. And ye have set your heart upon the riches and the vain things of this world, for which ye do murder and plunder and steal and bear false witness against your neighbor and do all manner of iniquity. And for this cause, woe shall come unto you, except you repent. Apostasy is a deliberate forgetting of God's hand in our lives. And in this case, it is a deliberate forgetting of God and his word in order to get gain, for gain in these instances was gotten via immoral means. It is a single-mindedness that does not have an eye towards God's glory, but rather individual glory. It is idolatry. In his no-holds-barred sermon, The False Gods We Worship, President Kimball calls the saints to repentance for forgetting God and worshiping at the altar of materialism, reminding us that our assignment is to use the many resources in our families and quorums to build up the kingdom of God, and to bless others in every way that they may also be fruitful. Like Brigham Young, who warned in his now infamous 1849 speech, the worst fear that I have about this people is that they will get rich in this country, forget God and his people, wax fat, and kick themselves out of the church and go to hell. He was always one with words. Um, so too, and great facial hair, like I'd like to point out. So too, does President Kimball stress that wealth and materialism cause us to forget our purpose in this life and our assignment as children of God, to use these materials to further the building of Zion. Our spiritual amnesia causes us to misuse the blessings that we have been given, expending such on what President Kimball calls our own desires and our pursuit of carnal security at the expense of missionary work, temple work, and fruitful service to all of God's children so they too may be blessed. Throughout the Book of Mormon, Mormon emphatically locates the root of this false doctrine here, in the being who tempted them to seek for power and authority and riches in the feigned things of the world, and thus Satan did lead away the hearts of the people. The love of power, authority, riches, status, and the vain things of the world are antithetical to the teachings of Christ. They are the teachings and tools that Satan uses to break up Christ's church. 
Indeed, just a few generations after Christ appeared to and walked among the Nephites, they began to build up churches unto themselves and adorn them with all manner of precious things. And the people of Nephi began to be proud in their hearts because of their exceeding riches and become vain, and gold and silver did they lay up in store in abundance. Like the Gadianton robbers who did turn unto their own ways and did build up to themselves idols of their gold and silver, the Nephites worshiped themselves, their money, power, contacts, networks, and so on. They set themselves up as false gods to be worshiped and feared. As a result, the scriptures were hidden from them, the Lord did take away his disciples, and the works of miracles and healing did cease. Each time God's people put their heart upon riches, or as we read in Mosiah 29.40, the lucre which doth corrupt the soul, the Holy Spirit ceased to strive with them as a people and as individual children of God. The Book of Mormon repeatedly warns us that if we who claim to have a fullness of the gospel, to have taken upon us Christ's name, and have committed to create Zion, instead, as Nephi says, grind the faces of the poor, then we are sealing our own condemnation. Alma cautions, if ye turn away the needy and the naked, and visit not the sick and afflicted, and impart of your substance, if ye have, to those who stand in need, I say unto you, if ye do not any of these things, behold, your prayer is in vain, and availeth you nothing, and ye are as hypocrites who do deny the faith. Therefore, if ye do not remember to be charitable, you are as dross, which the refiners do cast out, it being of no worth, and is trodden under foot of men. Samuel the Lamanite ups him one and offers perhaps one of the greatest warnings to us in our materialistic latter days. Behold ye the people of this great city and hearken to my words. Yea, hearken unto the words which the Lord saith. For behold, he saith that ye are cursed because of your riches and also are your riches cursed because ye have set your hearts upon them and have not hearkened unto the words of him who gave them to you. You do not remember the Lord your God in the things which he has blessed you, but you do always remember your riches, not to thank your Lord God for them. Yea, your hearts are not drawn out unto the Lord, but they do swell with great pride, unto boasting and unto great swellings, envying, strives, malice, persecutions, and murders, and all manners of iniquities. For this cause hath the Lord God caused that a curse should come upon this land, and also upon your riches, and this because of your iniquities." Samuel the Lamanite pulls no punches as he calls out the Nephites for putting their hearts upon riches and willfully forgetting the words of the Lord. They forget him as the creator of all and the origin of grace. They forget him as they set themselves up as the authors of their own prosperity. And they forget him as they neglect their covenants and persecute the poor. It's no coincidence that Samuel focuses on this issue as he's trying to prepare the Nephites for the coming of the Savior, for the Lord will not suffer such iniquity and inequity. By forgetting and rejecting the Savior, that which they treasure and to which they have turned their hearts shall be cursed, and their prayers will go unanswered, the Spirit will leave them, and all will be lost. Conversely, those who put their hearts upon the Savior and bind themselves to him will be freed, just as there are numerous Book of Mormon examples of those who put their heart upon riches, oppress the poor and the needy, and, and corrupt the word of the Lord to get gain, there are myriad models of how we can act as disciples of Christ. King Benjamin is perhaps the most recognized charitable figure in the text. In his great sermon, King Benjamin teaches that we can serve God by keeping his commandments, recognizing his grace, expressing gratitude for the blessings he has bestowed, and extending love to others just as the Savior has extended love to us. Unlike those who boast of their own worth and set themselves above God, King Benjamin calls his people to recognize that they are of the dust and saved only by the grace of a benevolent God. The atonement is the ultimate gift, the priceless treasure which neither corrupts nor disappears, but exists as an eternal and immeasurable endowment for us to receive. King Benjamin stresses that while grace is given freely, if we are to call ourselves true disciples of Christ, we must serve him with all of our souls. And having received Christ's priceless gift, how could anyone deny grace and charity to anyone else? 
King Benjamin stresses that those who have accepted Christ's grace will desire to succor those that stand in need of your succor and to administer of your substance unto him that standeth in need. And ye will not suffer that the beggar putteth up his petition to you in vain and turneth him out to perish. Why? Because the Lord did not turn us away when we petitioned him for grace, mercy, and love. As part of the covenant we make at baptism, we commit to care for all of our heavenly parents' children. Alma stresses that charity is at the heart of the baptismal covenant, linking the desire to come into the fold of God and be called his people with being willing to bear one another's burdens that they may be light. In a series of talks, President Marin G. Romney stressed that we look after our poor and distressed not only because it's convenient or exciting or socially acceptable, we should do it first and foremost in fulfillment of our covenant with the Lord that we will do so. King Benjamin anticipates what has become a common refrain among those who denigrate the poor and dismiss their petitions. Perhaps thou shalt say, this man has brought upon himself his misery. Therefore I will stay my hand and will not give him of my food or impart to him of my substance that he might not suffer, for his punishments are just. Here he anticipates the false distinction between worthy and unworthy poor that many employ to rationalize withholding charity from some. In the October 2014 General Conference, Elder Holland reflected upon this tendency to judge rather than serve God's children. Perhaps some have created their own difficulties, but don't the rest of us do exactly the same thing? Isn't that why this compassionate ruler asks, are we not all beggars? Don't we all cry out for help and hope and answer to prayers? Don't we all beg for, mis for forgiveness for mistakes we have made and troubles we have caused? Don't we all implore that grace will compensate for our weaknesses, that mercy will triumph over justice, at least in our case? Little wonder that King Benjamin says, we obtain a remission of our sins by pleading to God who compassionately responds, but we retain a remission of our sins by compassionately responding to the poor who plead to us. We cannot know each individual's history or circumstance, nor are we qualified to judge the worthiness of any individual to receive our help. Elder Nelson has cautioned that ours is not to judge. Ours is a covenantal obligation to care for the poor and needy, to prepare for their rejoicing when the Messiah shall come again. Instead of delivering judgment, we are invited to deliver joy. Too often, however, individuals twist the principle of self-reliance to justify withholding their means and charity from the poor. These individuals interpret self-reliance to mean an aggressive individualism where each person looks after and takes care of himself or herself. They claim that unrestrained charity undermines the principle of self-reliance and rewards laziness. In response, let me first say, that in nowhere in the Book of Mormon is this taught. And I read the whole thing again. Look at all these little notes, okay? Yes, King Benjamin worked alongside his people as self-reliance proponents like to point out. Yet he also closed his discourse saying, you should impart of your substance to the poor, every man according to that which he hath, such as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and administering to their relief, both spiritually and temporally, according to their wants, and see that all things are done in wisdom and order. Furthermore, King Benjamin's question, are we not all beggars, recognizes that none of us are self-reliant, or as former presiding bishop John Vandenberg reminded, everyone has a need, man does not stand alone. Those who claim to the contrary fail to recognize the privileges, blessings, and role of the Lord in their lives. As Professor Richard Davis has pointed out, too often self-reliance is a mask for material self-centeredness and used to justify inaction. Contrastingly, a study of the scriptures and early writings of the restored church illustrate that the church's definition of self-reliance is rooted in the desire to keep church members out of debt, to help them prepare for various catastrophes, and ultimately to help them be in a position to assist others in need. From Nephi through President Monson, leaders have stressed self-reliance not as an alternative to caring for the poor, but as the very thing that enables us to perform charitable service. 
None of us are self-sufficient and all rely upon each other and the Lord at times. And as King Benjamin teaches, our substance does not belong to us, but to God, to whom also our life belongeth. By assisting those in need, we get, help them get to a point in their lives where they can assist others. Practicing this Christian behavior requires a change in our hearts and our attitudes about poverty and privilege. We must challenge the pernicious myths about the poor and supplement them with truths. Today, it's socially acceptable to openly mock, demonize, or criminalize the poor. Misunderstanding and blatant misinformation about just who the poor are helps those who, for various political or ideological reasons, would use the poor as straw men to justify their positions. According to a 2015 Pew Research Center study, the majority of wealthy Americans surveyed believe that poor people today have it easy and that the poor have it easier than the rich. A study conducted at the University of California and published in 2012 demonstrated that as individuals grow wealthier, their capacity to empathize with the poor diminishes. Jacob saw this in his day, chastising his people. Because some of you have obtained more abundantly than of your brethren, you're lifted up in the pride of your hearts, wear stiff necks and high heads because of the costliness of your apparel, and persecute your brethren because ye suppose ye are better than they. And now, my brethren, do you suppose that God justifieth you in this thing? Behold, I say unto you, nay. Let us briefly address some of these myths. And to those of you who are statisticians and make charts and graphs, I apologize ahead of time. Myth number one, the poor are lazy. Reality. According to a 2015 study conducted by BYU professor Scott Sanders, along with colleagues at Cornell and LSU, the majority of the United States poor are employed at low-paying jobs, struggling to support themselves and family. Other, st other studies corrob corroborate this finding. Over 11 million Americans work, but don't make enough money to move out of poverty. At the current federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, full-time work earns someone just a little over $15,000 a year. Half of all American wage earners earn an amount that at most is only $4,000 over the poverty level for a family of four. Half. Furthermore, because of wage stagnation in America since 1970, the wages of the bottom 70% of workers in the U.S. have been flat, not growing with inflation or production. As a result, middle-class hourly wages have increased all of 6% since 1969, and lower-class worker wages have decreased by 5%. While the poor are working and are more skilled and productive than those in 1969, their wages are lower, and that, in addition to the increase in the cost of living and the rate of inflation, means their money doesn't go as far as it used to. According to economists at the EPI, had the federal minimum wage kept pace with productivity, it would be over $18 an hour today. Thus, according to the most recent census, 41% of those who received food assistance lived in a house with earnings from a job. The poor are working, they are just staying poor. Myth number two, the poor are poor because they are immoral or criminal. In reality, the poor make some, some of the same choices as those of us with means. They just don't have the same safety net to ameliorate their choices, whether that be psychological counseling, adoption services, healthcare, tutoring, rehab, and other interventions. One criminalizing myth is that all poor people are rampant drug users. The reality is that while some of those under the poverty level or seeking government assistance have substance abuse problems, studies consistently demonstrate that the percentage of drug users is significantly higher among the non-poor than the poor. Some states have enacted mandatory drug testing for those seeking benefits, another example of criminalizing poverty. Yet in Tennessee, for example, less than one half of 1% of Tennesseans who applied for public assistance failed a drug test. Whereas in comparison, the rate of drug use overall in the state was 8%. Last year, Utah spent 30,000 to drug test welfare recipients and found that only 0.2% of benefit recipients tested positive, whereas the state's overall drug use was 6%. And similar results have been seen in Arizona, Missouri, Florida, and Kansas. Myth number three, the poor feel they are entitled and just living off others. Reality, not only do the poor work, but they also pay twice the tax rate of the wealthiest Americans. According to the Institute 
on taxation and economic policy. Here's where my fancy graphs come in. In 2015, the poorest 20% of Americans will pay an average of 10.9% of their income in state and local taxes, and comparably, the top 1% will pay an average of 5.4%. The Salt Lake Tribune reported that in Utah, the poorest 20% of the population pay 8.6 of their income for state and local tax, the middle 60% pay 8.4, and the wealthiest 1% pay 4.8%. Whereas the word entitlement is often attached to the poor, less than 3% of all tax-based entitlements go to the 60, bottom 60% 60 of Americans, meaning 97% of tax entitlements or subsidies go to the top 40%. Changing our attitude cannot be done in the abstract or from afar. We must engage with our poor brothers and sisters in order to serve them. To do so, we must, as Jacob counsels, Think of your brethren like unto yourselves, and be familiar with all, and free with your substance, that they may be rich like unto, unto you. By getting to know the poor, we are forced to confront our own biases. We are sanctified and washed clean of unkind and unchristian thoughts when we actually take the time to get to know the poor and needy. They are not an issue, program, or part of a political platform, but instead, people. Elder Pace warns, if we aren't careful, we can depersonalize the activity of service by giving money and walking away and assuming the church will do the rest. We cannot, as individuals, be spectators to the pain and suffering around us and sit idly by and expect sanctification to take place in our lives. We cannot allow organizational lines to set up a layer of protection between a person in pain and ourselves if we are in a position to help. Rather, we must familiarize ourselves with those in need. Familiar has, at its root, the meaning of family or related. When we see those in need as our brothers and sisters in Christ and see ourselves as related to or implicated in their well-being, then we work towards cultivating that which Nephi grouped under the doctrine of Christ, a love of God and of all men and women. This work requires that we take a hard look at ourselves. We can learn from Captain Moroni, who, successful as he was, recognized the source of his success. He was a man whose heart did swell with thanksgiving to his God for the many privileges and blessings which he bestowed on Moroni and his people. Captain Moroni acknowledges that the many privileges and blessings he enjoyed were gifts from God and not to be chalked up to personal merit alone or some superiority, despite the paintings of him. That's just his gratitude. Um, <laughs> like him, we must recognize our privileges and resist the impulse to puff ourselves up and think that we have what we have because we are somehow better or deserve it. We must resist the impulse to be like the people in Alma 45, 24, who grow rich in their own eyes. If merit is to be recognized, it should be as Nephi does in his final sermon, recognize, recognizing and, quote, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. It is through serving others that we can show gratitude for all that we have been given, or as Bishop Vandenberg pleaded, let us show our appreciation for these basic needs our Father in Heaven has supplied by living that which we profess to believe and truly being our brother's keeper. The remission of our sins is contingent upon how we treat the least of these. It is like the words of one of my favorite hymns, because I have been given much, I too must give. Because I have been given salvation freely by the God of all, who am I to deny temporal or eternal salvation to another? Because I have been blessed with advantages that others have not, how can I deny them the help they need so that they might abandon the soul-damaging effects of poverty? This self-reflection requires humility and a div different perspective in how we see ourselves in this world. President Romney counseled, the Lord doesn't really need us to take care of the poor. He could take care of them without our help if it were his purpose to do so. No, the Lord doesn't really need us to take care of the poor, but we need the experience. For it is only through learning how to take care of each other that we develop within us the Christ-like love and disposition necessary to qualify us to return to his presence. We need these opportunities to burn those vanities from our souls so that we might retain a remission of our sins 
sanctify our souls, and become like God. So how do we do this? Like King Benjamin, Elder Pace reminds us that we cannot do everything, but still, we must do everything we can. I believe that for every person who looks for excuses to defer keeping their covenants of charity, sacrifice, and consecration until someday, there are many good people who don't know where to start or how to practice the Book of Mormon's commands. The poverty and suffering in our neighborhoods, nation, and world are overwhelming and could easily paralyze the best-intentioned individual. I propose that our care for the poor must happen on four levels, individual, community, church, and government. Individually, there are behaviors that we can change to give the poor more opportunities and dignity. First, of course, is changing how we treat the poor. Do we actually see them, or do we make them invisible? Do we look at these people, make eye contact, talk with them, get to know them, and treat them like people and human beings? Or do we ignore them, or even worse, treat them with disgust or disdain? Part of what we can do as individuals is actually recognize the poor among us, acknowledge that they are part of our lives, and treat them with the respect all children of God deserve. Then we should impart of our substance, everyone according to that which he hath. If he have more abundantly, he should apart more abundantly. And of him that hath but a little, but a little should be required. And to him that hath not should be given. And thus they should impart of their substance of their own free will and good desires towards God and to those priests that stood in need, yea, and to every needy naked soul. You will note that the only qualification the poor must meet to receive substance is need. Nowhere does it say that we should judge what others' needs are or what they should be, nor does it offer a breakdown of who constitutes the worthy versus unworthy poor. We are to impart to every needy, naked soul. We can do so through church donations, through financial donations to other service institutions, or through giving of our time to help others access medical, housing, mental health, and job training services. We can identify how we might be uniquely prepared to serve, given our time, talents, and resources, and then we must act. Can giving of our substance save all people bound by the chains of poverty? No. However, we have been charged to become like those described in Alma 24:18, who, rather than take away from a brother, they would give unto him. Furthermore, as individuals, we can consider how we use the riches we have been given. Do we store up stuff in abundance beyond that which would, which would satisfy our basic reasonable needs for health and security and happiness? I fear that too many of us confuse excess with real need. In addition, many of us may not realize that some stores' everyday low prices are low precisely because the company fails to pay their employees a living wage and contracts with factories outside of the US that use cheap, unethical labor practices. As a recent article in Business Insider noted, the first thing a company cuts when it is trying to increase its profit margin is its hourly workers' wages. Saving three bucks on a shirt may seem like a bargain. However, when that $3 savings comes at the cost of an employee who's working full-time at minimum wage and must apply for a government assistant to make ends meet, then the shirt's real price is exorbitant. Thinking about where we spend our money and using that purchasing power to enact changes to help our brothers and sisters live with dignity is something we can do. Notably, Walmart, historically one of the biggest offenders when it comes to ethical labor practices, has recently upped its hourly wage to $9 an hour, which roughly is about $18,000 a year, which is still sub-poverty level for a family of four, but better. And they did so because individuals used their purchasing power and voice to say they would no longer support such immoral practices. As communities, we can familiarize ourselves with the needs of the places we live and work with other groups, organizations, and agencies to meet those needs. A wonderful example of this can be found in Salt Lake City, where a group of community organizations came together and built homes for the homeless. This program has received national and international media attention because of the ways in which this community addressed poverty's persistent problems. In the past nine years, Utah has decreased the number of homeless by 72%, 
largely by finding and building apartments where they can live permanently with no strings attached. It's a program, or more accurately, accurately a philosophy called Housing First. The Housing First program identified how the old assistant models were flawed, making housing available only after certain health and work conditions were met, and they corrected it, acknowledging that one needs a roof over one's head so that one can get ahead. Lloyd Pendleton, the director of Utah's Homeless Task Force, reported, quote, the average chronically homeless person used to cost Salt Lake City more than $20,000 a year. Putting someone into permanent housing costs the state just $8,000, and that's after you include the cost of the case managers who work with the formerly homeless to help them adjust. The rates of substance abuse, health crises, and other problems that plagued the homeless dropped astronomically. The community's leaders, business, mental health, government, and religious came together to identify and address a problem, and in so doing, improve countless lives. And I'm proud to see that Provo's mayor, too, is working to establish a Housing First program to serve our local community's needs. As a church, we can continue to follow the commandment to pay generous tithes and offerings to support humanitarian efforts and to volunteer our time in welfare farms, bishop storehouses, and other support programs. The work that the church as an organization does to help our heavenly parents' children of all beliefs around the globe is just astounding. We celebrate this while remembering we can't rely on the church machinery to do all the work for us. We LDS members are the church, and we can be the Lord's hands wherever there is a need and fulfill the fourth myth mission of the church wherever we are. Finally, we can encourage our elected leaders to develop and support programs that assist the poor and the needy. Sometimes there appears to be a disconnect between LDS members profess religious beliefs as Christians and their political practices. Some American members of the faith are opposed to federal aid programs to the poor and needy for various reasons. Some see only the flaws in government aid programs and willing to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Some believe that the free market will fix everything. Some believe that any charity is an affront to capitalism. Some believe that the church could do a better job of administering relief and that welfare should be limited to religious entities. Some are opposed to government programs of any kind. Yet the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is neither structured nor equipped to assist every person in need, both in the United States and the world. Although growing, the Church has limited reach, limited resources, and offers limited types of aid. Hence, if we truly want to eradicate poverty, we must use every means possible to try to alleviate the suffering of our brothers and sisters, including government programs. As voters, we can vote against those whose platforms oppose social welfare programs and for those who seek to serve our brothers and sisters. We can call on our representatives to pass laws that help lift people out of poverty and improve the quality of life for all. I agree with His Holiness Pope Francis, who in his recent remarks before a joint session of Congress reminded the legislators that, you are called to defend and preserve the dignity of your fellow citizens in the tireless and demanding pursuit of the common good, for this is the chief aim of all politics. A political society endures when it seeks as a vocation to satisfy common needs by stimulating the growth of all its members, especially those in situations of greater vulnerability or risk. Legislative activity is always based on care for the people. To this you have been invited, called and convened by those who elected you. Yours is a work that makes re me reflect in two ways on the figure of Moses. On the one hand, the patriarch and lawgiver of the people of Israel symbolizes the need of peoples to keep alive their sense of unity by means of just legislation. On the other hand, the figure of Moses leads us directly to God and thus to the transcendent dignity of the human being. Moses provides us with a good synthesis of your work. You are asked to protect, by means of the law, the image and likeness fashioned by God on every human face. Unfortunately, currently there are many laws in the book that criminalize the poor, laws that make it a crime to sit in parks, to sleep in public, or, like in Las Vegas, to bring food to the homeless. In Nephi 20, 1 to 2, we read, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and that write grievousness which they have prescribed, to turn away the needy from judgment, and to take away the right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. 
It is our responsibility to let our elected officials know that these decrees are unrighteous, unjust, and unchristlike. Passing laws that ensure a living wage can be earned, that abolish flex time hiring, that prevent employers of wage employees from indiscriminate firing, that ensure consistent scheduling so workers can arrange for childcare, that provide job training and education benefits that will actually move people into the workforce. These laws will not only sure, ensure that wage workers, the poor among us, can find and keep steady work, but also will ensure a consistent and reliable workforce for employers there in helping the economy to grow and providing greater stability for all. In conclusion, I believe that if we commit our hearts, minds, and souls to the fourth mission of the church, then we will see miracles. First, our brothers and sisters in Christ who are impress, oppressed by the bounds of poverty will be freed to fulfill their divine nature and potential. Second, we will see missionary work accelerate. President Romney underscored that caring for the poor and needy frees oppressed spirits. The poor, released from the bondage and humiliating limitations of poverty, are enabled as free men to rise to their full potential, both temporally and spiritually, and all will be able to access the common ground on which the Spirit of God can meet them. In Helaman 3, 24 through 26, we read that serving the poor helped the church to grow such that there were thousands who did join themselves unto the church and were baptized unto repentance. Third, we will experience a greater measure of peace. As anyone who has read Jared Diamond's Gun, Germs, and Steel, or played what I call the cult of Catan, the settlers of Catan, know competition for resources always leads to violence. Yet, and I'm not talking among your siblings, yet, as Mosiah 6 7 teaches us, when the poor are cared for, there was no contention among them. We find temporal and spiritual peace in all of the Book of Mormon communities that privileged the word and children of God over the riches of the world because there were no ranks, jealousy, pride, or machinations. How wonderful it would be to experience such peace. Like those righteous Nephites, God can dwell with us at all times and in all things and in all places if we care for the poor and needy among us. And finally, if we strip ourselves of our pride, and pick our hearts up off our riches and place them upon our Savior and the poor, then we are promised a remission of our sins and the full blessings of the atonement. Both the Book of Mormon and modern day leaders promise that a greater measure of the Spirit will dwell with us individually and as a people if we keep our covenants to care for the least of these. It is my hope that we will think long and deeply about the problems of materialism, greed, and poverty in our time. The editors, authors, and prophets of the Book of Mormon certainly did, cautioning us at every turn to avoid the destruction that might befall us if we love riches more than God and all of his children. I invite us to tune out the noise of everyday life and the politics that would deafen us to these writer's calls from the dust. I invite us to confront our natural men and women that might bristle against their words. It is my prayer that we will heed the Book of Mormon's warnings and turn our hearts toward the least of these so that we might magnify Christ and prepare the way for his return. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dr. Matthews has uh, graciously uh, said that she would take a few questions if you'd like to ask a few, and then, uh, then we'll close after that. So. Thank you. No, I don't play Settlers of Catan. Next. <laughs> As my good friend Kim knows, I'm not a big game player. But I have observed people play it, and I know what happens. Yes. What 
Okay, that's a great question. I think that those of us in the BYU community are fortunate because over in the Wilkinson Center, there is a whole office devoted to service opportunities. And so if you're affiliated with the BYU community, you can work with myriad types of groups. I've, with American Studies, we've gone and helped build houses. Uh, we've also served in literacy programs and things like that um, because housing and education are so important to combating poverty. But also I know that the United Way, the Boys and Girls Club, and there are various others here in Provo um, that one could work with or one's own community in your neighborhoods and in your wards, you can identify those needs and based on those needs, then seek out the opportunities for some kind of institutional help as you work to serve people. Yes. Well, it depends on how you define prosper, because if one looks at the etymology of prosper, actually it talks about health and security, not necessarily accumulation of wealth and a huge portfolio and a private jet. So um, it could be in part that uh, competing definitions of prosperity, and it also could be that we with our 21st century eyes are reading prosperity in that way, or that the people at the time also confused. Because I think a lot of times we think, okay, I need to have the house where each of my kid have their own room and when they turn 16, they each have their own car. And, and that, that for some reason seems to be the base level, whereas one can argue that that would be a little more and contributes perhaps to a sense of entitlement that young generations feel. I'm not saying that people younger than me feel this, but I've heard on the street that sometimes uh, the younger generations feel that. So I think that really, um, if, we, if we come back to the idea of prosperity and what does it mean and how are we defining that to prosper in the land? Is that to build up the church of God? Is that to have a roof over one's head and food in one's belly? Or does that mean one needs a Hummer and jet skis? Right? then I think that we can see both in our own day and in the, the Book of Mormon times, perhaps where some of this disconnect happens. Yes? Yes, thank you. I don't know if you heard Dr. Harris up there, but he says when we prosper together, it doesn't mean that we're all poor together, but that actually we all prosper together. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, well, th oh, one more. Thank you. So Volunteers for America and Road Home. And I think that one way in which we can do this is actually talk with each other because I think if we pool our knowledge about these various programs and things that we actually can build a network instead of one person knows about this one thing and one person knows about that. But somehow in our communities, again, if we come together, then we can really work to build Zion now. Yes.
Yeah, well, and and I think that you in your position as teacher might actually have an opportunity to encounter that with some of your students. You'll know those who are actually struggling. But there's this great book um, called uh, Hand to Mouth uh, that a woman who is working poor writes about her particular life. And she mentions that one of the things that for her most helps her at times is when people actually recognize her. Um, when they don't see the person behind the counter at, at the drugstore, it just as a face making an exchange or the person clearing their plate, but that somehow those who are working these really hard jobs, right, laboring on their feet, whether it be in a restaurant or in a nursing home or cleaning homes, that you actually recognize them, say hello, and treat them with respect, something that we don't always do, say, with our waitresses or things like that, that that goes a long way to, first of all, their dignity, building their dignity. As for helping the working poor, again, my own personal favorite is to try to get an increase in the minimum wage and a living wage so that using our vote and our voice to say, look, here are ways in which we can treat these workers as human beings, that's sort of my route. But I know that there perhaps are more direct and local ways that other people could suggest. Yes. Well, it's interesting you raise that because today in a class with Dr. Colson, uh, we were talking about the various ways in which violence um, functions and that it doesn't necessarily need to be physical altercations, but that violence on the language, uh, on the level of language, how we talk to and about each other. Do we call them welfare queens or do we call her Sarah Jones, right? on the level of language, on the level of the ways in which educational systems are set up, work and labor systems are set up, that those very things can do violence to people in keeping them from actually moving out of poverty and into a stable life. And so that it need not just be physical violence, but we should also think about the ways in which how we think, how we talk, and how the various institutions that we participate in might wreak some sort of violence on the poor and needy that keep them in that position. And, um, and as we talked about, um, perform that psychological violence. You don't need to physically restrain someone if they believe they're worth nothing. They won't move or change. Yes. Yeah, oh, most definitely. I mean, I think that the Book of Mormon and, and, and all our scriptures talk about the poor in spirit um, and our duty to seek them out, recognize them, and serve them as well. And oftentimes, those who are struggling, those who have mental health, I mean, that many of these things come together so that they aren't just um, perhaps living hand to mouth, but they also have some psychological struggles or emotional struggles, or they're isolated and removed from family. And so it really, the onus is on us in our immediate sphere to see those people, to recognize them and to reach out in whichever way we can. So thank you for raising that. Yes. Well, this is the percentage of their income. So the percentage tax burden of their income that they're, they're yearly income is taxed at a higher percentage than those in middle class or in the upper classes. It's not the number of dollars, but it's the percentage of their take home. Yeah. 
Right. And that is the narrative that's communicated over and over again. But if you actually take a look at the tax figures, which are readily accessible uh, through um, the office, the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, and likewise uh, through um, Pew, Research. Pew Research. Thank you. Sorry, my brain. I'm starting to shut down. <laughs> but I'll uh, forge ahead. That um, that is actually the opposite. And I think that those who are in positions to have the public's ear are those who have the most to lose if we were to change how we tax. And thus, uh, they will tell a different story when actually the numbers don't shake out that way. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Well, what I found is that basically every generation, there are prophets who are talking about this, which for any of you who have ever taken a religion class at BYU, you've learned that if there's repetition in the scripture, it means we're supposed to pay attention. But it also means that we haven't been paying attention. And so I only used a small percentage of what I garnered. I, I tried to get folks in our more contemporary time who talk about this, but as we see, even back to Brigham Young, he was concerned about these things. And so Elder Holland's talk is the most recent iteration of this, and I think that it is significant because um, he is speaking during a time when the disparity is greater than it ever has been, and we have more poor people, and particularly at that time because of the economic crisis that started in 2008, that there were more people who were unconventionally poor, that it drew our attention to these things even more so. And so I anticipate that as we continue, and as um, if, if, if we continue upon the same path, we're going to be hearing more and more about this, particularly as we move forward and move towards, you know, um, more millennial type things and second coming and all of that. I'm not saying the second coming is coming, but I think that these concerns, just if we take the Book of Mormon as our model in preparing for Christ, all the prophets pointed out how we're not treating the poor in the way that we should. And if we want the Savior to come, and if we want him to receive us, then we need to change how we're thinking about it. And I think that we could put Elder Holland in that category as one who is saying, hey, if we want to continue spreading the gospel and to build Zion and to usher in the return of the Savior, then we need to think about how we are treating the least of these. Yes, well, um, it's something I've been thinking a lot about lately, in particular um, in regards to Africa, because I'm team teaching this course, um, it, part of which looks at that in post-colonial Africa. And what we've been discussing is the ways in which um, developed nations uh, uh, sort of reasserting almost an imperial power over um, undeveloped nations by absorbing their debt and making them beholden to us. And, and the difficulty in trying to figure out, well, you know, countries are in need, they're suffering, there are certain things that they need, yet at the same time, one could almost argue that at times it's a predatory lending system, not unlike what we saw that caused the economic crash in the United States, in which wealthier nations are preying upon those developing nations and uh, lending them exorbitant amounts of monies in order to once again extract the resources 
um, from those countries that once were accessible back in the good old days of colonialism and then were not in the days of independence. So that's my take given, of course, the particular lens through which I've been thinking about it lately. Okay, I just got the, the thing. So thank you again all for coming.